Now everybody, Captain Al speaking with your training tips designed to help make you a better, more knowledgeable flight simmer, pilot, or aviation enthusiast. Have a seat, let's strap in and stow the HUD and see what is on the horizon for today. Our briefing today will cover, under the category of flight training, flow patterns part two for the B747-400 PMDG. And part two will be uh, airborne in cruise flight and we'll be setting up for the descent procedure followed by the descent checklist and then the approach procedure followed by the approach checklist in preparation for landing including approach briefing. Once we land and clear the runway we would do our after landing procedure followed by our after landing checklist and then pulling into the gate Stopping the airplane, we do our shutdown procedure followed by a shutdown checklist. And then if everybody's off the airplane and we desire to do so, we would do the securing procedure followed by the securing checklist. So let's hop on over to the virtual simulator. Okay, we're back in the uh, virtual simulator for flow patterns part two. We're currently at the uh, flight level 390 en route to San Francisco. We've got about, uh, let's look at the uh, progress page, we've got about 427 miles to go. So we're still pretty far out, but we'll set up for the approach for the purposes of this video. We're going to set up for the ILS uh, runway 28 right at uh, San Francisco, uh, looking at the weather. Winds are pretty light and variable, and we anticipate that that may be what they're using there. Uh, we'll pick up the ATIS a little further in the flight, and if we need to modify it, that's fine. So to set up for the approach, uh, and again, you can consider this a procedure. This is uh, setting up the pilot monitoring would normally uh, set up the approach. Uh, he programmed the CDU and uh, once he's completed everything and he's looked at the approach chart, he set his minimums, then usually uh, the pilot flying will transfer control to the pilot monitoring and then the pilot flying will check what the pilot monitoring did on the, in the CDU and then if he's happy with everything, uh, he'll brief the approach. And after he briefs the approach, uh, transfer control back. And then uh, normally at some point we're approaching the top of the sun point and then we do the descent checklist. Passing through the transition level, and then we do the, uh, as we go through that level on the way down, we do the approach checklist. So we're a little bit early in setting up for the approach, but that's fine. So we start with the uh, CDU. We're gonna do the approach preparations for that. Uh, we sometimes refer to this as the Y pattern. It goes from the departure arrival function key to the legs, to the nav rad, to the knit ref. And this kind of forms a little Y here. You can see it with the pointer. And uh, so if we start with the departure arrival key and we push that, we will get the arrival page for San Francisco. And that is because the logic is such that we are more than uh, half the distance of the route. Uh, or more than 400 miles, whichever occurs first. In this case, with uh, going to San Francisco, it's probably we've reached beyond the 400 mile point. And the logic figures at that point that you want to look at your destination arrivals, not your origin arrivals. Now, if this isn't the page you want, remember you can always go to the index. And when you go to the index, uh, it will take you to the DEPAR index for Route 1 and Route 2 and any other airports you want to look at. Now you can't make selections here, but you could put an airport in here like uh, you put, um, you know, Minneapolis KMSP or Miami KMIA. Um, you could look at their arrivals, you can look at their departures, but if you try to select it, nothing would happen. Uh, if you tried to select a, an approach, um, because it's not our origin and it's not our destination on Route 1 or Route 2. So you could look at it, but you couldn't select it. So in this case, we want to go to San Francisco Arrivals. Uh, but again, we wouldn't have to do that because the logic's going to take us there anyway. Uh, important to note that there are two indexes in the airplane. One is the uh, 
DEPR index. So if we push this at uh, the L6 position, it takes us to the departure arrival index. But if we are on an initialization reference page like we are here, we have the same index looking prompt down here at L6. If we push this, it takes us to the initialization reference index, which is a different index. So the whole key is, are you on a are you on a initialization reference page, or are you on a departure or arrival page? That'll determine what index it takes you to. So let's select the, uh, in this case, let's select the ILS2, right? Uh, we don't know what we're going to do down there, so we're not going to select the transition. If ATC gives us a transition, great, we can always modify this. We already have our arrival as part of our flight plan programmed in. I don't want to select seep and intercept because what that would do right now is intercept a line into seep and on the final approach course. And if I were to push that and execute it, it would wipe out everything I'm doing right now in LNAV going along my present route. So the only time I'd use this is if I'm on radar vectors for the approach and I wanted to intercept the course into seep and on the final approach course, then I could push that and of course I could execute it. If I do that right now, it would wipe out everything. I'm going to Firefly here, and then on, it would wipe all that out if I were to execute that. So obviously, I don't want to do that. So let's go back here, select the ILS 2A right. Notice it is selected. No transitions. My arrival's in there. Go ahead and execute it. And I'm pretty much done here. You can see ILS 28 right is active now. The Bodega 2 uh, arrival is active with the transition that I think was the uh, Melbeck transition. And uh, now we go to legs page and check what we have in the legs page. Well, here we are in the legs page. Uh, again, if you want to step through the route, you can. We could go to plan mode. We could go to the we're on the legs page. Adjust your range as necessary. And then we can step through the route. There's finer. There's found. There's Milbuck. And of course, these altitudes and speeds are uh, off of the chart. We check the chart and see that that's what we're expecting. If ATC doesn't tell us anything different, that's what we're going to expect to do. And again, we would check that off the chart. So lower the range just a little bit. So it looks like we're going to cross Mulbeck uh, at or above flight level 290. We're going to cross uh, John at 280 knots at or below flight level 280, but above flight level 240. And then we're, um, looks like another one, a big load to uh, cross Bigelow. At or below flight level 230, but above flight level 190. And then it lies at 280 at uh, 16,000 or below at the Vega. At or below 13,000. And Cork at 11,000. So we've got a bunch of restrictions here that we check against the plate. We won't take the time to do that now. And then you can see we go to uh, Lazit, Bodega, let's bring the range down. Cork, 250.11. And then we go to uh, Bricks, looks like. Bricks is pretty much right over the airport, and then we go out from there on a 140 track for vectors. So depending, if we get that far, then ATC, we can expect somewhere along in this area, flying the 140 after uh, bricks, that we're going to get the uh, radar vector should the approach. And then, of course, there'll probably be some speed restrictions, and uh, San Francisco will fit us in then with the other traffic arriving. And then you can see that uh, after the 140 track, we've got the uh, SEPIN. Uh, which is part of the approach, part of the ILS to it, right? Seeping at 3000, axe mole at 1800, and then the runway. And then from there it's the missed approach, which is to fly a 284 track till above 420 feet. That's so there's no turns uh, during the missed approach. 
And then from there, we're going a 251 track to intercept a 283 to Vicu, and then we're holding at Vicu. Of course, we could check the holding uh, against the chart as well. 281 right turns inbound. And make sure that's correct. We check all this against the chart as we step through. So we'll say we did that. And uh, we'll go back to the map mode. And you can see there's no discontinuities. The only thing we have here is the uh, after the 140 track for vectors. That's a vector line that goes out for, uh, I think it's 350 miles or something like that. And we're going to expect to get vectors off of that at some point. Uh, to Sepin or Axmo, depending on how low it takes us. Or the ILS runway to it, right? So nothing we need to modify in the legs page. That's the second step of the Y. And we go to the NAVRAD page and check what we have here. 111.7.284, that matches with the plate. And now the ILS is parked because we're still way far out. As we get closer, this will uh, become active and it will unpark. Uh, compass locators, we can check if there are any in tune the ADF. And then, of course, VORs will just leave uh, auto-tuned. Pre-select, we don't need anything in there unless we have some preference to put something in there. So depth bar, legs, nav rad, and the last step in the Y is to go to net ref. And we'll set our flat 30 speed. Right now, we're anticipating, right now, that's based on 533 weight. If you go to the uh, progress page, you'll see that uh, we're going to land at San Francisco with 28.4 on the fuel. And so if you wanted to, you could actually calculate this out and see what you can land with. But you'll find that at this point, uh, being as far out as we are, uh, this is probably going to only vary by a knot or two, and we'll always update it as we get a little bit closer. Chances are, by the time we get there, it's going to be 140 or 139. We'll put it in there for now. That puts on our PFD VRF 30 141. It uh, is off scale, so it just uh, puts the whole thing here, F30-141. And that completes the Y pattern. So the Y pattern is depth bar, select your approach, the legs, check it, and uh, modify if necessary or leave any discontinuities in there if uh, it's normal. And then nav red, check your ILS frequency and the EDFs you can add manually. Make sure these are still being auto-tuned. And then a net ref and select your VREF 30 speed uh, or 25 depending on what you're landing with. Most airlines land with 30, some land with 25, but the majority land with 30. So that's the Y pattern. We set up the CDU. And then if I'm the uh, first officer setting up the approach, I'd probably ask the captain what kind of auto brakes would you like. That would be if the auto brake selector is on the aft aisle stand, which in some airplanes it is. If the auto brakes are here, then the captain is going to set it. So if the captain is the, uh, if the first officer is the one that's flying, then I probably ask the first officer what kind of auto brake would you like. Because I'm going to set it since it's right in front of me. In this case, we'll set uh, two for the auto brakes. We could set three. Um, typically one or two is used on a dry runway, three or four is used on a wet or slippery runway, and then max auto would be for those situations where you want the maximum amount of braking you can get. Let's increase our range a little bit. So we'll leave it two, it's a long runway and uh, two is adequate, the runway is dry today. And then we're going to set our minimums. Our minimums for the ILS 28 right are going to be 213 feet on the barrow. You notice the barrow starts at uh, minus 100, minus 101 it disappears. And of course uh, we're bouncing around here with a little bit of turbulence, so we'll see if we can set it. <laughs> if you move it up it goes faster, but of course you're also dealing with some bumpiness of the turbulence. So we're going to set 213 for the minimums. Uh, you could set the radio altitude, the radio altimeter as well, um, or radio minimums. Um, however, most airlines do not do that uh, on a Cat 1 approach or a non precision approach. Let's see if I get this thing to go faster without. Not too far. So go back down to 213. 
This is one area that's much easier to do when you physically have the knob. Of course, this is one of those knobs that gets loose a lot too, and it can be frustrating sometimes when this starts to go bad this time. Because yeah, it becomes very hard to set the numbers. It's 213. Okay. So we'll set Barrow for a Cat 1 approach, and uh, that's normally all we set. Some airlines will set the radio minimums to maybe, you know, if it's 200 foot height above touchdown, they'll set 200 here. But that's for reference. This is what your calls are based off of. The uh, pilot monitoring's calls will be based off the Barrow of 213, not the radio. Radio we'd set for a Cat 2 or 3 approach uh, for, you know, radio minimums then. Um, but for a Cat 1 approach, we're going to set barrel, or a non-precision approach, we're going to set barrel. And then we would, um, more than likely, once we're set up, uh, pilot monitoring would let the pilot fly know, okay, I'm all set up. Pilot flying then would transfer the airplane and say, okay, we're still at flight level 390, and uh, we're in LNAV, ENAV. Uh, you have control. I have control. And then the pilot flying would go into the CDU and check everything that the pilot monitoring just put in. So he would do the same type of thing. He'd go to the departure, the DEPAR page, check the arrivals, check that the ILS is uh, active. He'd go to the legs page, check for any discontinuities, check the routing, make sure it looks good. If it doesn't, he can always discuss it with the uh, other pilot. And go to the uh, Nav rad page, check that the nav radios are acceptable, and then go to NetRef and make sure the VRF 30 speed's been programmed in there. And then he's going to set his minimums, and uh, the auto brakes are set, and then he will brief the approach. So let's see if I can get the plate out here, and we'll do a we'll do an approach briefing since that's part of the kind of flow here, kind of the procedure. Again, we're a little bit early doing this when we're still this far out, but I don't want to wait to. We're still 300 miles out. But we're doing a video, so we'll do it right now. And I'm just waiting for the approach chart to come up on my uh, iPad here. And let's see, San Francisco. Approaches, and we want the ILS 28 uh, right. So here it is. So since we briefed the takeoff, uh, we'll brief the uh, we'll brief the landing as well. So this will be uh, the ILS uh, runway 28 right at San Francisco. It's 11-4, uh, dated 4 November 16. Minimum sector to the north is 5100, to the west is 3500, to the east and south is 4500. That's off the uh, San Francisco VOR. 111.7 is the localizer frequency, 284 is the uh, final approach course. Uh, we'll be crossing the glide slope uh, at axle at 1,800 feet, going down to a decision altitude of 213 feet. That's a 200 foot height above touchdown. We will be looking for a ALS F2 approach light system with a PAPI on the left side. 1,800 RVR or half statute miles required for the approach. In the event of a missed approach, it's going to be climbed to 3,000 on the San Francisco VOR radial 281 to Vicu intersection. 12 San Francisco DME and hold, or is directed by ATC. Here's a minimum climb gradient, we need that. And there are some notes here that we do through transition level, altimeter set in inches, uh, talks about simultaneous uh, approaches, and we've read through the notes. And uh, we plan on manual landing. The runway itself is um, 28 right, 
is 11,870 feet long. We'll probably plan on clearing at um, more than likely at uh, high speed tango uh, or perhaps delta or kilo or high speed Quebec. One of those toward the uh, last third of the runway. And then, chan and then chances are we're going to have to hold short of uh, 2 8 left. And then once we're cleared across from there, we'll probably make a right turn on Bravo, uh, depending on what ATC gives us. And then we'll take Bravo all the way around to the Gulf Concourse to G106, G106, which is our gate. So it'll be uh, either Bravo or Alpha of the gate, depending on what uh, we're doing. More than likely Bravo. And follow it all around. And so that's the briefing. And then if all that's complete, we transfer control back. I'd take control and then I'd go ahead and say, okay, descent checklist. And then we do the descent checklist. Then, of course, as we leave uh, from our top of descent point, we start down. Then, as we get past uh, our transition level and we set our altimeters, which are going to be 3032. Uh, that's what the weather's doing right now. In fact, we can probably just preset that now, even though it's a little bit early. 032. I think that's the current. It was a while ago, but oops. So we'll go 3032. We can update that again if we get a different altimeter. Let's see what the latest is for San Francisco. It's uh, it changed. 3029. Huh? So let's modify that. Three zero two nine. Okay, so that uh, once we get below that, we do the approach checklist. And then we're ready from there. So we'll pick this up again after the landing. Where we go through our after the landing procedure and then our uh, shutdown and securing procedure. So see you then. Okay, we're on the ground in uh, San Francisco now. We're simulating that we're on the uh, landing roll, the uh, gears down, flaps are 30, and uh, we're simulating that we just landed. We'll uh, continue down a little bit further here. And then we'll go ahead and add some reverse now. And this is the simulation that we just landed. So we'll taxi clear at the high speed here. Five thousand one hundred feet remaining. And we'll hold short of runway two eight left for crossing traffic. And while we're here now, we'll do the uh, after landing procedure. The after landing procedure is done uh, mainly by the first officer. The captain has a couple things to do. Um, one thing that the captain will do is come down and stow the uh, speed brake. So he's going to be the one to bring his hand down there, stow the speed brake. And then he'll come back up and turn the weather radar off. And that's all he does. Stow the speed brake and weather radar off. Um, I should preface that. That's if the auto brakes... Let's go find the auto brakes again. 
That's if the auto brakes are back on the aft aisle stand. If the auto brakes are here, uh, he's going to go ahead and turn the auto brakes off as well when he's uh, when he can do that. So with the auto brakes right here, that's kind of his job as well to get the auto brakes off. So besides the speed brake down, weather radar off. Um, this is not Boeing procedure, but a lot of airlines do this, and I, I agree with it. It's still, he'll also turn his flight director off. With the Boeing procedure, it's done during the shutdown or parking check. Um, a lot of airlines do it now because it's just cleaner. You don't need the flight directors now as you're taxiing in. So with the captain, speed brake down, weather radar off, flight director off, and auto brake off. That's pretty much what he does with the auto brakes here. If the auto brakes were back on the aft aisle stand, uh, then the first officer would get that. And all he would do is speed brakes, weather radar, flight director off. The uh, first officer, meanwhile, he's got the most to do. So he's going to come up here and start the EPU. Uh, if we require him to sell any ice on the ground, he would turn the sell any ice on. In this case, we don't need it, so we'll just leave it in auto. We would turn the uh, landing lights off. We could turn the uh, turn off lights off. We'll leave the taxi light on for taxi. And we turn the strobes off. And that's pretty much all we do upstairs here. So it would be uh, start the APU, the cell any ice if you need it, and turn the lights and strobes off. Taxi light can remain on. And he's going to come downstairs and continue his flow. Uh, again, not a Boeing procedure, but uh, it's my procedure and a lot of other airlines procedures to turn the flight director off now. You don't need it anymore. He'll come off with his terrain at this point. Uh, then we're going to move down to the lower quadrant and uh, he's going to retract flaps. Now in some cases, it depends on the airline, in some cases um, the captain will call for flaps up after landing procedure and then the first officer would do the flaps uh, and then continue with the after landing procedure. If it's a straight Boeing procedure, generally you'll come down through like I'm doing and when you get to this point you'll retract the flaps without uh, the captain's uh, command. So it just depends on the airlines. With some airlines the captains like to call for that, flaps up after landing procedure. Uh, in the case of Boeing, it's just after landing procedure, and you do it. When you get to this point, you'd retract the flaps like we have. And then he'll come down and uh, get the transponder to, uh, in this case, to transponder. Since we're taxiing in under the ground radar. Now, if the auto brakes were here, now he'd also turn the auto brakes off, the FO, but in our case it's not here, it's on the uh, forward instrument panel. So that's what the first officer does. Um, just to review it again, he comes on top here, starts the EPU. The selling the ice if required for taxi in if you have icing conditions. Not required today. Landing lights off strobe lights off and then we come down flight director off if you're not using Boeing procedures that's fine cleaner that way as you taxi in terrain off as he was in terrain and then come down and get the flaps up which they are and then come back and get the transponder to, in this case, transponder because we have ground radar. And then if we did have the auto brakes on the aft aisle stand, we get the auto brakes to off as well. In this case we don't, so it's captain's duty. And then we call for the after landing checklist. And that's assuming there is an after landing checklist. Uh, in the case of Boeing, there is no after landing checklist. 
Uh, it's just a procedure. It's just a flow pattern. I think the thought is with Boeing that you're busy taxiing and uh, it becomes a procedure more than it does a, a checklist item. Now other airlines will disagree with that and say, oh no, we're adding an after landing checklist and we're going to put a lot of the items that we did on the flow, we're going to check it to make sure that we've done it. So that's the feeling. So you will see a lot of airlines add an after landing checklist, but for Boeing you'll notice uh, in the generic when we look at checklists, you'll notice there is no after landing checklist for Boeing. Uh, so let's go back um, outside. And we'll say that we're cleared to cross runway 28 right now. Uh, 28 left, sorry. So at this point, I'd probably have the first officer, if he did the flow already, I'd probably have him uh, turn back on the landing lights and the strobe lights as we cross the runway. Zero. Right. We won't do that now, but we would turn on the lights and strobes, and then once we're clear of the runway, we would then turn off the lights and strobes. So we contact ground, and ground says, uh, you can make a right turn there on uh, Bravo Taxiway and taxi via Bravo to gate uh, G106. Or they might ask us what our gate is today, and we'll tell them G106, and then we'll say, okay, right turn on Bravo Taxi via Bravo to Gulf 106. So we'll make a right turn here at Bravo. And then we would taxi all the way around to uh, Gulf 106. We're not going to do that. We're just going to make a left turn here at uh, whatever the next taxiway is. And then we'll take any available gate and uh, do the shutdown uh, procedure followed by the shutdown checklist. We'll take it looks like kilo here. And we'll just come over here and take one of these uh, empty gates. This is not a custom model, so there's no uh, marshallers or gate numbers or anything like that. This is just a generic uh, FSX model for San Francisco. So we'd obviously be seeing the marshaller and follow his instructions or if there's signage. And then we follow the signs for stopping. As we approach the gate, we're going to check that our brake pressure is uh, good. And we'll check our speed. And we want to make sure our brakes are working as well. Have a uh, stop a little abruptly there. It's hard to stop with just a couple of knots. And not having rudder pedals, it's kind of stop hard to stop smoothly. <laughs> um, so we're at the gate. So we'll go ahead and set the parking brake. And now the first officer is going to go to the overhead panel. Let's go up there. down a little so you can see this. 
and he's going to establish AC power. So in this case, uh, external is not plugged in yet. So we're going to put on the EPU. It's available. Now, if I'm a freighter, this is all I would do is just put on EPU generator one. That way, the main deck handling bus stays powered with uh, EPU generator two being available. And they can start unloading the airplane if they need to open the nose or whatever and start cargo equipment on the main deck. They can do that. If I'm a passenger airplane, I really don't care because there is no main deck handling bus. And I am a passenger airplane today, so I'll select AP Generator 2 as well. Then I'm the first officer is going to come down. He's going to take the uh, number 4 uh, demand pump, and he's going to go to the aux position. And then number 1, 2, and 3 would come off. Now, even if you have an aux position in the freighter, you're not going to go to aux on shutdown. You're just going to go number four to aux, number one, two, three to off. That's kind of the signal once the FO does this that the captain can shut down the engines. So let's go down to the lower quadrant here. Uh, zoom in just a little bit so we can get our pointer. There it is. And we'll shut down engines one, two, three, and four. Now, when the uh, captain shuts them down, the first officer is going to come back to the seatbelt sign, uh, which actually these would have been on. They'll come back to the seatbelt sign and turn the seatbelt sign off. And then he's going to go back to the overhead panel, and now he'll continue with his flow. So he's going to start with the uh, fuel pumps and turn all the fuel pumps off. In this case, we were tanked engines, so we just turn off the main tank pumps. He's going to turn the beacon off. And then he's going to come downstairs here and select status because we want to write up any status messages that occur during the flight. In this case, you'll notice there are no uh, status messages, so that's good. Nothing really to write up, but that's why we select status to check for status messages. And then I'll come down to the lower panel. and bring our transponder to standby. Then if the chocks are in, and we get the signal that the chocks are in, uh, the first officer would reach up here and turn the number four to off. And then the captain can release the parking brake. And you'll see if I cancel the ICAS messages here, the parking brake is released now. Parking brake's off. You could leave the parking brake set as well. It just depends. It's captain's discretion whether you want to release it or keep it set. And then the... Uh, captain would call for the shutdown checklist. So you can see there's not really much that the captain does. It's mainly FO. So just reviewing that again on the uh, shutdown. First officer comes up here and goes number four to aux. Number one, two, three, off, off, off. Uh, before that, he established AC power with the APU. So APU generator one on, generator two on, aux, off, off, off. That's the signal that the captain can shut him down. Captain shuts him down. One, two, three, four. First officer goes back and gets the seatbelt sign. Ding. And then comes back up here and selects fuel pumps off, 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 off. Beacon off. And then come down and select status page. Uh, to check for status messages. This is on the Boeing procedure where you turn the flight director off. So if you haven't, you know, if you don't take my suggestion of turning them off during the taxi, then this is where you turn it off at the Boeing procedure. The Boeing procedure would be come down here, select status, turn the flight director off, 
and then continue down to the uh, transponder and transponder to standby. So you can see everything does fall on the first officer and the, you know, the captain, the only thing he's really not, uh, other than releasing the parking brake, he's really not doing too much. And then we'd be ready, if everybody's off the airplane, we'd be ready for the securing procedure followed by the securing checklist. So the securing procedure is to bring the IRUs to off. Um, some airlines will, come back down here, some airlines will check the IRS errors. Um, we can't do it on the PMDG model. I think you can on the iFly, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but on the PMDG model, you cannot. But some airlines will go to the um, initialization reference page, one of them, go to index, go to maintenance. And you go to the maintenance pages. Now you see here, this is all PMDG stuff. Um, so there's no maintenance pages. But on this page, there'd be over, I think it's over here on the left side, in the position two, it would say IRS monitor. And when you select that, that's going to give you the IRS errors for the left, center, and right over the duration of the flight, and you'd log those errors. That's maybe just a side note of interest. Uh, but not necessary for us flight simmers to do that. So uh, we go ahead and uh, bring the IRUs off. Off. In the airplane, you have to pull these out and rotate them to the left. They just don't. If you try to rotate them directly to the left, it won't move. You have to pull out and rotate left. So IRS is off. Emergency exit lights off. We lift the guard and uh, bring the switch to off. And half cargo heat off. And packs off. That's the Boeing procedure. Now, if I add one more thing to that, and that's the window heat. And some airlines will turn this off as part of the securing. It's not part of the Boeing procedure, but it's part of my procedure, so I turn it off. So it's basically those items. Uh, IRS is off, emergency exit lights off, half cargo heat off, packs off, and window heat off if you choose to do that. And then we call for the securing checklist, and uh, or whatever it's called for particular airline and then uh, that would be accomplished. And then from there we'd either leave the airplane like this, we could turn down all our lighting. Um, if they hook up the external power we could switch to external power and shut down the APU. Um, we could do the electrical power down procedure if we're going to do that. I mean normally that's not done. You know, normally you just would leave it like this and at some point they would plug in external and then we go ahead and switch to external power. So that completes part two of the flow patterns. In the uh, next module we'll look at uh, the checklists and we're going to cover two of them. The generic Boeing uh, checklist which is licensed by PMDG to utilize and then we'll look at my checklist, which is the subsonic flight training checklist. And you'll see what's maybe a little more typical of what airlines do, because a lot of times they modify the Boeing checklist. They may stick right to the Boeing checklist. It just depends. If it's a smaller airline, it's probably going to just stay with Boeing procedures and use the Boeing checklist. Uh, and other airlines where they're bigger and they have their own training departments and standardization departments, then they tend to... Um, deviate or get away from Boeing procedures. They still value the manufacturer and what they've done and they obviously look at the manuals but then they due to their own airline culture and philosophy they then determine how best to operate the airplane and so then it can become uh, over years it can become a much different looking product than what the Boeing uh, procedures and or checklist is. Not wrong just different. So we'll stop there and thanks for watching. Okay, let's lower the HUD and go flying. Until our next briefing, keep the blue side up. Captain Al, out.